Good afternoon. Another Tuesday, another Tuesday lunchtime service, and another opportunity to welcome you very warmly to our worship of God in this brief half hour that we share together. We're going to start by sharing in the singing of the song, Bless the Lord, O My Soul, Worship His Holy Name. Let us worship God. Let's take the opportunity to bow in prayer together before God. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father in heaven, it's always good for us to have that opportunity to pause, to bow in your presence, and once again to rejoice in all that you are, to bless you, to praise you, to worship you for the multiplicity of different ways in which you enrich our lives. And above all, for the revelation that you've given of yourself in Jesus Christ, your Son, you've made known the God that you are great beyond all measuring. You are the eternal God. We can't begin to get our minds around the sheer vastness of your own glory. But you are wonderfully wise. You're incredibly strong. You are marvelously kind. And in all things, you are true and righteous And we rest in that knowledge, knowledge that you made this world, that it is yours, it's run by yourself, you know what's going on, and you are ordering all things aright as you move things forward in accordance with a a vast, glorious purpose formed back in eternity that you're working out in history and that will issue in splendors and pleasures beyond our imagining in the realms of eternity. We're glad humbly to praise you, to thank you, to seek you in and through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We acknowledge our Father again that that's the only basis in which we can draw near to yourself. We have no righteousness of our own, our Father. We are marred creatures. We've gone astray. We've spoken out of turn, acted in ways that are out of line with your will and your ways. We've been rebels, we've been defiant, we've presumed to know better than yourself in 
so many different ways, our Father, we have sinned against you. We acknowledge that and seek again your forgiveness in the Lord Jesus and seek to learn of him that we may grow in our delight in him, grow in our obedience to him, grow in our fruitfulness for him. And so we'd ask that as we turn to your word, you would speak through the pages of Scripture and by your Holy Spirit apply its truth to our hearts in a way that will meet us in our present needs and do us good. Grant us then that blessing, Father, we pray you as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we continue today in looking at the book of Ruth. We're back in chapter 2 of the book of Ruth. So if you do have a Bible to hand, you might like just to get it out. Ruth is the eighth book in the Bible, and it's a short little book that tells us the story of a lady by the name of Naomi who went with her husband Elimelech to the land of Moab because of a famine that had been there. And uh, she went with her two sons. The two sons got married to Moabite girls, one called Ruth, one called Opa. And during the 10 years or so that they were there, um, uh, Naomi's husband died and then her two sons died. And she eventually hears that the Lord has visited the land of Israel. She goes back with Ruth to the land of Israel and to Bethlehem in particular. And Ruth goes out into the fields as they'd have done in those days to glean uh, behind the harvesters. So let's, uh, let's read in from verse 14 of chapter 2 of the book of Ruth. Let us hear the word of God. At mealtime, Boaz said to Ruth, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. And then she threshed the barley she'd gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law Naomi saw how much she'd gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she'd eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked him, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she'd been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. Amen, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. The, uh, the particular note that I want us to pick up on today in that reading is the uh, awareness that Ruth has that she is noticed. You'll see that she makes reference to that in verse 19 there, uh, and she's made reference to that early. She's been surprised that Boaz should have noticed her. And part of the reason for wanting just to, to slow down sufficiently and concentrate on that particular note that is struck there, the way in which Ruth is noticed, is because it does strike at something really very fundamental in our humanity. From our earliest years as little infants right on into adulthood, uh, we want to be and we need to be noticed. We need to know that we matter and it is um, one of the characteristics of the day and generation in which we live that people will go to extraordinary lengths today to be simply noticed. Sometimes uh, youngsters in their teenage years have been asked in random surveys on the television, you hear this, that they've been asked what it is that they want to be when they grow up. And the answer quite often is, I just want to be famous. Uh, which is another way of saying that I, I want someone to notice me. I want the world to take notice of me. When they're asked what they want to be famous for, they say they don't really mind as long as they are famous, as long as someone notices them, as long as they are noticed. And I suppose part of the reason for that is because we live in a world that is, in so many regards, really very, very impersonal. 
and in a computerized digital age. We become often simply numbers, statistics, just another item indistinguishable from um, others around us. And all of us do want to be noticed. One of the hardest funeral service that I, services that I ever conducted was uh, many, many years ago, 30 plus years ago now, in Cumbernauld. It was the funeral of a man called Hugh Ferguson. And I remember vividly both the man's name and also the man, because the only friend that he had in the world was a black dog. And it was a very rare funeral that I conducted where I was the only mourner. It was just me and the coffin. No one noticed. No one knew him well enough. No one was familiar enough with him to be aware that he'd passed away, that he'd left this earthly life. He lived and died unnoticed. It was a, a very somber and a, an extremely sad occasion to live out life like that and, and just no one notices. No one knows that you're there and no one notices. Now, it's, it's that sort of thing that um, Naomi is picking up on when she says to, to Ruth, um, who was it that took notice of you? Um, Ruth has expressed surprise before that she should be noticed. And um, it's by this man, Boaz. And Boaz is what um, is sometimes spoken of as a type of Christ. That's to say, um, before Jesus comes into this world, before God sends his son into this world, he is uh, so eager to share with his people what it is that he is going to do. God himself so thrilled in himself at the sheer magnitude and wonder of the grace that he is going to demonstrate and display in the giving of his son, that he, he uh, uses different individuals to, to say, uh, the one who's coming is, is going to be something like this. And Boaz is one such individual in whom we get these pictures of what Jesus will be like. I've made reference to that already, the fact that he's born comes from Bethlehem. That's where the Son of God will be born. Uh, he is one of our relatives, says Naomi, and that again is indicative. Jesus comes to be one of us. And uh, here we see one of the striking truths that the Scripture wants to underline, the way in which the Son of God notices you. You are not alone. You are not someone who simply does not matter in the grand scheme of things because the Son of God himself notices you. Running through the pages of the gospel records that recount the life and the ministry of Jesus, time after time, it is this remarkable thing that we uh, become aware of about Jesus, that he, he notices people that otherwise are marginalized, people that otherwise are just out in the periphery out of people's sight because they, they don't really matter. They don't have much to contribute to society. They're not rich. They're not educated. They don't have gifts of one sort or another. And often people just don't want to know them. And so you find when he comes into Jericho, Jesus goes there and he hears this voice in amongst a, a multitude of other different sounds, the whole crowd of people gathered around and they're making a noise and they're shouting out and they're talking and so on. But in amongst all that noise, he notices the voice of one man who is crying out. One man crying out, uh, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And uh, this is a blind man, a blind man by the name of Bartimaeus. And the crowd simply tell him to shut up, to be quiet. Jesus will not be interested in you. Jesus got far more important people to see and to be interested in. You have nothing to contribute. You are a blind beggar. You've got nothing to contribute. But Jesus notices him, says, bring him here. Uh, and then he says, so what do you want me to do for you? He notices that man. It's the same when he goes into Jericho, goes through Jericho. Uh, he's aware of this tax collector, the people that others despised, the people who were so small that he couldn't be seen behind all the crowds. And he's there, hidden away up in the tree. Jesus notices him. 
He notices in the temple, he notices the, the widow with her might, that tiny amount of money that she's putting into the offering bowl that is not going to make much difference at all to the, uh, to the income of the temple and the, the work of the, the temple there. But Jesus notices this woman, points her up to his disciples. He notices in the synagogue in Luke chapter 13, he notices the woman who has been crippled and bent double for, for years and years and years. No one has been able to do anything about her, and she's just hovering around the background, but he notices her. And, and part of the reason for highlighting that through the gospel records is so that we might learn to understand that um, you are significant to God. He notices you. Jesus does notice you. You are in his line of vision. He's aware of you, aware of your circumstances. It's being pointed up for us here in this narrative about Boaz because all of this narrative is helping us to see in advance in anticipation just who this Jesus is and what he will be like and why he is ultimately so wonderful. And he is the one who takes notice of us. And I want you to see through the narrative here that we've just read in verses 14 to 19, I want you to see uh, how that taking notice of you actually translates into your experience. And there are these four uh, different headings that I want simply to work through very briefly with you. The first of which is that he calls your name. He calls you near. You see there that uh, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here. Uh, come over here. Um, it is the summons of Jesus himself, obviously. Come unto me, he says, all you that are weary and laden with heavy burdens, I'll give you rest. It is that invitation. He calls us to himself. No matter who we are, no matter that we are weary, no matter that we're laden with heavy burdens, no matter that we carry around a whole load of baggage, baggage in terms of our background, baggage in terms of our relationships, baggage in terms of things that we've done, uh, crimes that we've committed, sins that we've committed, and so on, all that baggage, just come, he says, come over here. And, and it's precisely that that Boaz strikingly is saying here as his opening gambit. That's what it means for Jesus to notice us. First of all, he bids us come near to be with him. Uh, and that is no matter who we are, um, it would have been a surprise to folk that uh, Boaz should have asked this particular person, uh, partly because she was a woman, partly because she was a widowed woman, partly because she was a widowed Moabite woman, um, just the last person on earth in some ways that uh, Boaz would normally have been expected to be inviting to come to him. And yet that's his opening gambit, come over here. And, uh, and it is um, very, very striking through the scriptures to find that that's again and again the way in which Jesus addresses different individuals, uh, how he says to Zacchaeus, the man that everyone else wanted to write off, the man that everyone else despised, the man who was hated and, uh, and rejected and scorned by the population of Jericho, Jesus says, come down, Zacchaeus, come over here, because uh, I want to come to be with you in your house today. Um, he, he wants you near and that's, that's good news for you. No matter who you are, no matter what, what may be true about you today, uh, Jesus loves to have you near. So he says to you, come here, come to me, he says, all you that are weary and laden with heavy burdens. And if that is you today, if you are just weary, weary on the back of uh, eight months of lockdown and restrictions and wondering where on earth it's going to end, weary because of all the pressures that there are, weary because of all the problems that you have, weary just with life itself and laden with a whole load of burdens, then he says, just come, just come to me, he says. Uh, let's carry them together. Let me bear the weight of them. Come to me and I'll give you rest. And I'll give you rest by, by sharing the, the burden with you. That's the first thing. Second thing is, um, to your surprise, uh, he, he likes your company. Um, Boaz says to Ruth here, come over here, uh, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. Uh, he is having a meal with her. It's, it's not a, a slapdash uh, gourmet type of meal, but it's a pretty basic meal, but it is a meal, and that's the point. He will share his table with her. 
And, and that's in the ancient world of the Near East there, in, in Middle Eastern terms, that was a big deal. That was, that was kind of opening your heart. That was saying, I, I'm glad to have you around, glad to enjoy your company, glad of the opportunity simply to sit down and over a meal, not simply to consume the food because the food isn't really the most important part of it. It is the company. It is the ability to be able to talk with one another, to share with one another, to listen to one another. Um, let's do that, he says. I, I'd like you to be able to have that meal with you. I'd like to have that opportunity so we can we can talk back and forward with one another in that manner and so he invites her effectively to his table to share that fellowship and that friendship with him and we we see precisely the same in the Lord Jesus Christ um, indeed to this day the the kind of lasting um, visible, tangible sign of our relationship with Jesus is precisely this. Have some bread, says Jesus, and, and some wine uh, to ourselves to this day as well, indicative of the fact that he, he actually likes our company. It's not that he, he tolerates us. It's not that he turns a blind eye to our sin and our wrongdoing and things like that. He, he likes your company. He likes it when you, you spill the beans and pour out your heart to him. He likes to be able to share his heart with you as well. Astonishing and wonderful. And it is a, a, a picture, it is a, an image that is uh, prevalent through the scriptures. You find it here in Boaz, this type of Christ. Uh, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar uh, with me. Um, Jesus with his disciples sitting there for that last supper. What is it? It's bread and it's wine. And in the book of Revelation chapter 3 at verse 19, as he knocks on the door of the church at Laodicea, he says, I stand at the door and knock and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door to him, I will come in and eat with him and he will eat with me. Uh, and that's just the wonder of the invitation. He, he delights in your company loves it when you, you simply pour out your heart to him and tell him how you're feeling, what your problems are. Uh, he, he wants you to do that. Give me your heart. Pour out your heart to him. And uh, that's the, the significance of the, the table there. Third thing that we learn from this in terms of Jesus taking notice of us is uh, not only that he calls your name, not only that he likes your company, but he meets your needs as well. You'll see there that um, in, in verse 14, we, we read that she ate all she wanted. And um, that's, again, um, translating literally, it's uh, she was satisfied. Uh, all her needs were met. See, she had more than enough. Um, uh, the hunger in her heart, the hunger in her belly was, was satisfied. She ate and was uh, satisfied. And, and, and that, again, is um, an emphasis that the, the scriptures underline for us time after time. He meets, Jesus meets our every need. Um, Paul puts it like that in Philipp uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, where he says, My God will meet all your needs. Now, she, she had um, the need here of food and that's what she's, she's discovering. In this man, her needs will be met. What he says, and, and eat with me. And, and she eats and, and she has all that she wants. She is satisfied, well and truly satisfied. Um, and then the, the scriptures simply magnify this particular incident, uh, enlarge that on to the canvas of eternity and declare to you that my God will meet all your needs whatever they may be, uh, however problematic they may seem, however impossible of resolution they may appear, my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. That's, that's part of the wonder of the gospel, what makes it good news. This God notices you and uh, is pleased to provide for all your needs. He anticipates all your problems, your difficulties, and is pleased from the riches of his glory to meet you in those needs, to satisfy those needs. 
Uh, we were looking on Sunday evening at Psalm 145, and in verse 16 of Psalm 145, we, we read there of the way in which he satisfies the desires of every living thing. That's the, the, uh, the grace of our great God. And, and all of this, again, pointing us forward. That's the point. Um, in these, these narratives here, um, before Jesus comes, God giving a preview, just a little trailer to, to whet our appetite and to help us to see just how wonderful is the gift that he will give of his own beloved son, who will be for us infinitely more than Boaz could ever be for Ruth. But Boaz gives us a picture, a sense, a glimpse into what this Jesus will be. Uh, we, we delight in him. That's who he is. He takes notice of you. And part of that means that he will meet all your needs. And then finally, the, the last point that I want you to notice in this connection is that he, he overflows your cup. Um, you'll see that uh, in the, the verse that I've just read there, that she ate all she wanted and she had some left over. And then when she goes back at verse 18, we read that Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she'd eaten enough. Um, it is repeated for us there to underline the point that uh, uh, not only does she have what she needs, but she is given way beyond what she needs as well. There is a superfluity about the giving, the generosity of this man, Boaz, towards us so that she, she is um, um, more than provided for. And, it, and it's that in many ways which really uh, knocks Naomi for sex and, and bowls her over. Uh, just who on earth has done this? Where did you work? Who's the man? Because whoever it is, may he be blessed under God for his generosity. It's quite, quite beyond the realms of what either of them could have anticipated or could have expected. And, and that's the whole burden of Scripture again, that in Jesus, the, the one who comes and who notices us, for all that we, we are the last people on earth that he should be noticing in a sense. We're conscious of that ourselves. Paul speaks of himself as being the chief of all sinners. And yet he, he says the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ was poured out in abundance on me. He said, even although I was a persecutor and a violent man and insulted God, and blasphemed against God, but it was poured out upon me in such abundance. Um, that's Jesus for you. The feeding of the 5,000, not only are their needs met, not only is the hunger abated, they had all that they wanted, we're told, and there were 12 basketfuls left over. There was such an abundance in the giving of the Lord Jesus Christ. You find that in Psalm uh, 23, the psalm that probably is the best known chapter in the whole of the Bible, the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. You'll, you'll never be lacking. You'll never need anything as he is your shepherd because he leads you. He knows how to, uh, to, to pace you, to bring you to places of quiet waters, to give you green pastures, to feed you, to nourish you, to sustain you, to direct your paths, to lead you through the difficult, times of life always there to protect you, to shield you from what otherwise might damage and harm you. And then we come in the, uh, the metrical version of the psalm, my table thou hast furnished in presence of my foes. My head thou dost anoint with oil and my cup overflows. And, and that's the wonder of it, that in, in the presence of my foes, the psalmist says, a table prepared for me. And that's exactly what is happening here. Moabite women, they were the enemy. And, and here she is in the presence of those who would historically have been her enemy and for whom she would have been the enemy. And yet this Boaz spreads before her this table and uh, anoints her head, as it were, with oil and her cup overflows. Um, that's what she's conscious of. And, and that's the, the richness of the grace that is extended to us in Jesus. There is, is not only all that we need in time and eternity to cover all the particular conditions and all the circumstances that we face, but there is more than enough. There is that superfluity, the abundance that overflows. 
And Paul in Ephesians 3 verse 20 speaks about the way in which God is, is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or even think. Uh, and that's why it's just such a wonderful thing to see in Boaz a, a picture, a pointer to Jesus and to discover that he is the one who takes notice of you. So whatever your circumstances today, uh, be encouraged that um, uh, he notices you, uh, bids you come to him just to find rest in him, assures you that he's, he's glad to share his table with you, to have you speak with him and pour out his heart to you. He'll meet your needs and do so in a way that will see you in the fullness of time, look back and say, my cup has overflowed. May God bless his word to your heart. May you be encouraged, may you be strengthened, and may you press on in the knowledge that he will indeed watch over you, be with you through all things. God bless you richly. Amen.